I've been waiting to tell you something. It started with the fisherman. He taught them a new way of life. He turned everything upside down to make it right side up. Forgive seven times? Try 70 times seven, he said. Just be nice? No. Give it all over, whatever is asked of you. Reach over the tracks. Yeah, go to that part of town. <laughs> Cling to the eternal and shake off the chains of this earth. Sin messed everything up, the whole world, but he made it right. Our Father, who is in heaven, holy and honored is your name. Your kingdom, it's come. I'm pledging my life to bring it closer and closer, to show the power of your divine love, to declare deliverance from death and sin. To all people, to each race in every language. Making disciples of all nations, I'll own my responsibility. Go all in and make it real in my corner of the world. The authority Jesus has already been given. The kingdom that will come on earth as it is in heaven. An everlasting dominion that will never pass. Because he beat death. Coming as the king of the Jews and finishing it all as the king of the world. His throne and authority are sovereign. You heard right. Forgiveness without boundaries. Hope in all circumstances. And a peace that passes understanding. Because death is conquered, eternal life is established. That's why we keep going. Why I keep telling. The Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. The root. The offspring. The bright morning star. Baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. From street to street. Nation to nation. He is the King. Power and glory belong to Him. His kingdom will have no end. There's room for you and room for me. Room for everyone who calls on the name of the King. And His name is Jesus the name above all names. The first and last. The one and only. And he loves you. And he loves you. He loves you. And he loves you. And that is what I've been wanting to tell you. Good morning. Welcome to worship here at Open Arms, whether you're at home, tuned in on Facebook or YouTube or here in the worship center. It's good to be in the Lord's presence. I don't know about you, but I had goosebumps during that video. You know, got, I'll admit, I got choked up a couple places, you know, when the, especially when they were ending that with about Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you, that theme, keep coming. Indeed, he really does love each and every one of us. And that is good news. I invite you to grab hold of your connection card, if you would, and uh, put some information on it. Keep it nearby. We're going to come back to it. And all of us are going to be encouraged to take one next step in our spiritual journeys. If you're at home, please click the link on Facebook or YouTube so that you can use the digital copy there. It's also a great way to share information or ask for prayer requests and so forth. And uh, so I invite you to do that. Um, please sign up for one of the five small groups that are being advertised. The lists are on the wall there in the Welcome Center near the bulletin board. And uh, if you have some more questions about that, we can get you some answers. We'd love you to just join in. We really grow together best in smaller groupings. So it's worth taking a shot at it and see how it goes for you. Remember, please that we are in the midst of raising funds to replace our leaky roof. Uh, you can use the envelope here. You can always use the envelope and mark what you're giving us for, uh, regular offering or for the roof. If you're using Givelify, which many of you are, uh, you can do the same thing there. You can notate what the giving is for. Uh, I'm encouraging us to pray and to discover what our Lord wants each and every one of us to do to meet the $35,000 goal. I know it sounds huge. It is. But our God is greater, and I believe he wants to provide to take care of this place that belongs to him. So please pray. If you have any questions, contact me. If I don't have the answer, I will contact uh, someone else to get the answer for you.
Good morning. It is so good to be here. Um, I am glad that we get to do this um, every Sunday where we get to stand together and lift up the name of Jesus because there's just something that happens when we do this together, that we get to sing his praise together, and it is so good. He fills this place, and he fills us, and I ask that you would stand this morning. Join us as we sing about Jesus. And our defender suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious light. Forever seated high. I believe. the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in life eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints the 
I invite you to be seated. As we enter this time of prayer, I ask you to close your eyes, visualize what's going on in your life or in the lives of people that you care about. And is there a place that comes to mind where you, you or someone you care about needs deliverance? Whatever it might be, do we or do others need freedom that comes only because of Christ Jesus? Think of that. Capture that image in your mind and your heart right now, please. Heavenly Father, whether we're at home worshiping here or in the worship center, you know what we're thinking right now. You know what circumstance or situation or personal need or whatever it is that came to mind where we're asking you to help us in a divine manner. Indeed, Lord, for some of us, the deliverance that we're asking for will take a miracle that can come only from you. But we thank you today, Lord, that you are the God of miracles. God who can work in astounding ways in our lives. So I boldly ask, Lord, in accordance with your Bible, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit and free us, touch us, restore us, heal us, provide for us. And in doing so, Continue to reveal yourself as the God who really loves us. Indeed, the God who gave himself for us. And I pray that this coming week, or maybe right in this moment, someone would experience that divine touch from the Heavenly Father. That you would open our eyes to see you at work, Lord, and would give you the glory for who you are and what you are doing in our lives. So, Lord, as needy people, we also turn to you with thanksgiving because you've been caring for us. We look back on our spiritual journeys and we can see in hindsight where you've been at work and what you've been doing for us and with us and with the people that we care about. So we thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy 
your loving kindness and ask that you would simply continue to do your perfect work in each and every one of us and continue to draw us to our Savior and Lord Christ Jesus for it's in his name that we pray Amen
I invite you once again to grab hold of that program you received if you're here in the worship center. And uh, there's some fill in the blanks that are there. If you're at home, there's a link to the digital copy of the message for today. I invite you to click that link so you can follow along with uh, where we're headed for this morning. Indeed, today we are starting a series of messages to answer this question. What does Jesus do for us? What does Jesus do for us? Today we're going to look at the fact that Jesus lives for us. Jesus lives for us. It's Easter today. Not only a mini Easter every Sunday morning, but it's Easter celebration in the Orthodox Christian Church. They use a different calendar than some of the rest of the church uses and so forth. So, it, But it's grand celebration. A former manager at uh, Starbucks is actually an Orthodox priest now. And it's fun to hear from him and how God's at work. But as we considered last week and again for today, Easter is not merely a time to kind of look back at an historical event, as important as that event is. Easter reminds us, my friends, that Jesus is alive now. He is alive now. Easter indeed celebrates Jesus' resurrection from the dead. And it reminds us or invites us to follow this one who is alive forevermore. Indeed, Easter challenges us about what is possible for us as we daily journey with Jesus. How is he at work? How does he want to be at work in our lives? In all sorts of circumstances and situations. It's fun to follow Christ and discover how he is at work. Now, all four Gospels contain the Easter story. And if you read those uh, Gospel accounts, as you see them outlined there in the program, with the page numbers corresponding to the Bibles we have here. And if you want a Bible so you can follow these things and check them out for yourself, feel free to grab a Bible and take it home with you and make it your own, all right? But there are differences among the, the accounts. But I believe that the differences in the Easter accounts indicate truth. It indicates truth. For me, if the four accounts in the Gospels were exactly the same, then we could assume that the writers got together to get their story straight. They kind of law and order, right? People are arrested, they try to get their story straight, so they're telling the, right, the same thing. We're junkies to watch old re re reruns, reruns, that's an old word, for TV programs or whatever. But there's little evidence, really, of literary collusion, we might say, among the four gospel writers. The four gospel writers give us their unique observations of the very same event. Now, before we think, well, I don't know about truth, it, uh, they should all match up or whatever, think of the eyewitnesses and their accounts of those who observed the very same auto accident. Depending on where the witnesses are standing, sitting in another car perhaps, that's their perspective that they have. And when the authorities would question the witnesses to a car accident, it's going to be different from person to person to person, from witness to witness to witness. I believe that's the same phenomenon that we have in the differences among the accounts of Easter that we find in God's Bible. But one thing definitely is true. All of the accounts absolutely agree the tomb was empty. All accounts absolutely agree the tomb was empty. I invite you to circle that. If you don't remember anything else from this morning, I know there's going to be uh, at least one song that was put together by our music team that's going to be rattling around in my head all week. But along with that, keep in mind that all accounts absolutely agree the tomb was empty. Indeed, when the, 
women got to the empty tomb, the angel said, he is not here, he is risen, just as he said. Indeed, we know that Jesus had predicted his suffering, his death, and his resurrection. We can look at three instances where Jesus did that in the Gospel of Mark. Now, we find it in other Gospels as well, but I wanted to make it easy for us today as we consider these things this coming week. The question really is, how did the tomb get empty? Well, I think we can dismiss out of hand the notion that Jesus' followers went to the wrong grave. You know, they got to the graveyard, they zigged instead of zagged, and they wound up in another place that was open still or whatever. No, no we're told in God's Bible that some of Christ's disciples went with those who buried Jesus, and they observed where they put his body. And we can get confused at times, but, you know, we find on Easter Sunday morning that the women in particular are going to anoint the body of Jesus. They know exactly where he is. So we can say, you know, for those who say, well, they went to the wrong place. I mean, it's not a Monty Python kind of a thing where it's one or two steps off of the truth. Then I have a question for us. Is it probable that someone could have taken Jesus' heavily guarded body? Talking about probabilities here. Talking about professional soldiers who were sent there to guard the tomb of Christ. Matthew chapter 28, we read the account of where the soldiers go and tell the religious authorities what happened when the stone was rolled away and they looked in and Jesus was gone. Because Jesus is alive. And the religious authorities paid the soldiers to say that the disciples came and stole his body in the night. I mean, really, the probability of a ragtag band of followers of Jesus, I mean, guys who were like us, okay? Could they have overpowered the, the guards? Would they have come when the guards fell asleep? That, that was like, you know, soldiers didn't fall asleep on the watch. It just didn't happen. So the thought of someone coming and taking the body when it's being guarded in such a grand manner is just ridiculous. In fact, Jesus' opponents had heard him say that he would rise from the dead after three days, and that's why they posted the soldiers in the first place and put the seal there on the opening with the rock to the tomb. They didn't want Jesus' disciples to steal his body and then say, look, he's risen, he's gone, when actually they just took him and put him somewhere else. Not at all. The tomb is empty because Jesus is alive. If we look past that first Easter Sunday morning, we discover that Jesus proved he is alive by going on what I call a victory tour. A victory tour. He's conquered death, sin, death, hell, guilt, and shame for all persons. What a victory tour. That's a great thing that happened there. We see that Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. They were the first witnesses to the resurrection of Christ. And we might say, why would Jesus appear to women? Since in the ancient world, women were not considered reliable witnesses. Because the truth of Jesus' resurrection for all people. And by going to the women, Jesus kind of takes what is thought to be true in the ancient world and kind of flips it on its head. And says there's a new reality because Jesus is alive. Jesus appeared to two men traveling to Emmaus, and they recognized him in the breaking of the bread when they were stopped for the night, but then Jesus was gone. Jesus appeared to ten of his disciples in a locked room, and they didn't have to unlock the room or open a window for Jesus to get in. The resurrected Lord who is alive now could just simply enter. That's in my mystery bag. Okay, The ability to walk through walls and stuff like that. I believe Jesus did it, could do it at any time. It's just 
caused me to think at times. Jesus appeared as well to ten disciples, plus doubting Thomas. He hadn't been there the first time Jesus entered the room, but he was there the second time. Do you remember what Thomas wanted to do? Poke, poke, poke. I'll only believe if I can kind of put my fingers in the nail prints in his hand and stick my hand in his side that was stabbed by the spear. But when he saw the risen Jesus, the living Jesus, All he could say is, my Lord and my God. Jesus appeared as well to his disciples for a meal on the beach. Had them fix up some fish and stuff. Jesus also appeared to reinstate Peter as a leader of the early church. We remember from the gospel writings that Peter had denied Jesus three times on the night that Jesus was on trial. Jesus told me he was going to do it before the rooster crowed, and guess what? It happened just the way Jesus said it would happen. No surprise there. But on the beach, when Jesus was walking with Peter and with John, Jesus asked Peter three times if he loved him. Do you love me, Peter? Do you love me, Peter? Do you love me, Peter? And if you read the account there in John 21, every time, each time, Peter said yes. And it's no coincidence that we have the three denials and the three questions of do you love me? Because forgiveness is granted to Peter in a manner that he could know without a doubt that he was truly forgiven and restored. Not just one word of restoration and forgiveness, but three. One for each denial. God's Bible then tells us that the living Jesus ascended to heaven. We read from Acts chapter 1, these words, when Jesus had said this, he went up. They watched him going. Can you imagine what that must have been like on the mountaintop with Jesus, and then all of a sudden he starts floating upwards? Okay. Then a cloud hid him, and they did not see him anymore. Another supernatural event in the life of Christ Jesus to prove who he is that he is God in human form. And in the ascension, we find a future hope for all Christ followers. And we're going to look at that truth in a couple of weeks from now. And how it matters for us in our daily living. But whatever the future has in hold for us, which is glorious, as I read in God's Bible, we have the present confidence that this living Jesus lives for us. This living Jesus lives for us. We read from Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, these words. The Son gave his own life so that we could be clean from all sin. Next week we're going to talk about Jesus forgives our sins. That's what he does for us, okay? After he had done that, Jesus sat down at the right side of God in heaven. Now in the ancient world, the right side of a monarch seated at a, seated at a table was a place of honor. And here Jesus takes up that place of honor in heaven, next to the heavenly throne. So the question for us is really, what difference does it make that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God? We could break down that question simply with, so what? What does it matter to us? We're going to consider three benefits or differences that Jesus' position at the right hand of God makes for us. Here's the first one. Jesus is now pleading our case. He's pleading our case. The Jesus who lives for us as our helper, our encourager, our mediator, our tender assistant. And Jesus, we're told in God's Bible, is even our defense attorney who represents us before the Heavenly Father. And when Jesus speaks on our behalf, when he pleads on our behalf as sinners in need of a Savior, the Father hears the one pleading our case, and grants to us forgiveness as we journey with Jesus. 
1 Timothy 2 tells us there is only one God, and Christ Jesus is the only one who can bring us to God. He is what's called a mediator in God's Bible, a go-between, if you will. On this side, we have a holy God who wants us in his presence. Over here, you have people like us who are sinners in need of a Savior. But the good news is the Savior has come and done everything to bring us forgiveness. And he's bridged the gap between where we are to where God wants us to be in his presence. All the time. Jesus has done all of this for us. And as he pleads our case, we're reminded that the living Jesus is also at our side as our present helper. By the gift of his Holy Spirit, God is with us and within us every step through every day. Second, what difference does it make that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God is this. Jesus is now praying for us. Different than his pleading for us, but they do kind of overlap, right? Because Jesus lives forever, he is able always to save those who come to God through him. Why? Because he always lives asking God to help them. Or to personalize it, because he always lives, he's asking God to help us. To help us with whatever we're facing. With whatever that issue or circumstance or whatever it was that you thought of in our time of prayer where we need deliverance. He's asking God to help us to deal with those things. Over the years, I've heard, Rev, you have a direct line to the man upstairs. Your prayers are much better than mine. And eh. survey says that's wrong. It's untrue, okay? Our prayers as we are are precious and important to the God who loves us and gave himself for us. Now, I'm not saying I won't continue to pray for you and the circumstances and situations that you let me know are going on in your life, but you can pray, too, about those things. Again, not informing God about what's tough in our lives, but just bringing those things forward and being reminded that the Savior is with us. There's only one person who has a direct line, a special connection in prayer to our Heavenly Father. Do you know who it is? Jesus. Jesus. And we're told in God's Bible that he is now praying for us. The living Jesus, in fact, is conferring with our Father for us. He is presenting our needs to the Lord God, but still we're encouraged to pray for ourselves and for others, okay? And then third reason, what difference does it make that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God is that Jesus is now preparing a place for us. That's in my mystery bag, too. Because Jesus, as God is the Lord who spoke the word and vast universes came into existence. So I'm wondering how he's preparing this place. You know? There's times where I picture Jesus the carpenter, the hammer and nails and wood and whatever. Because I'm kind of simple up here for the most part. But Jesus said this, do not let anything trouble your heart. Again, that thing that you thought of when we were praying, okay? You believe in God, and you must believe in me also. In my Father's house are many rooms. King James says that there's many mansions, glorious places to, to live for eternity. In my Father's house are many rooms. I am going to make a place ready for you. If I go, I will come again. I will come to take you so that you may be with me. I often read this passage from John's gospel at a funeral service. But it's a truth that's real for us apart from a funeral service. It's an everyday reminder, I believe, that we have a home with Christ. For all eternity. For 
all eternity. We can count on him preparing that place for us. And in doing so, the living Jesus wants to change us so that indeed we can live with him. See, Christ is in the business of transforming sinners into saints. Saints are those who are becoming holy. Saints are those who are becoming more and more like Christ Jesus. Saints are those who journey with Jesus as Savior and Lord. Saints are those who say to the Lord, do whatever you need to do down in the deep, dark recesses of my heart and my mind to make me to be pleasing in your sight. God, indeed, the God who is alive forevermore wants to restore us so that we can live in God's presence just like our ancient ancestors lived in that perfect place until they messed it up. Question this morning, friends, as we close. Will we accept the benefits of the living Jesus? We're faced with a choice. God always gives us a choice. He's not going to force his love and forgiveness and kindness and presence on any one of us. He wants us to say yes. So we close with 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, we've been given a brand new life and have everything to live for, including a future in heaven. And the future starts now. God is keeping careful watch over us and the future. Friends, we're not doomed to attempt life on our own. To, what, what's the phrase? Fake it till we make it? Our Lord's intention has always been that we would live in his presence every moment of every day, and that starts here and now. Because if we're not journeying with Jesus, we can start the journey. Lord, forgive me. Thank you. And we begin the journey with him. And we begin to live within his holy presence. Grab your connection card, if you will, please. Because maybe there's a next step that we'd like to take in our spiritual journey. And again, if you're at home, if you haven't already, please click on that link for the connection card. Maybe our next step is to investigate the truth in God's Bible from today's message. Maybe our step is to accept God's forgiveness for the very first time and to begin journeying with Jesus. Maybe we need to ask Jesus to plead our case to God about. You have something there that you want to add? Maybe our step is to request Jesus to pray with us, for us, about what? Maybe we want to allow Jesus to prepare us to be with him forever in that place he's preparing. And I'm planning on being here next Sunday. I hope you are as well, whether in the worship center or tuned in on home. And then there's number seven, which is a blank line where you can jot down the next step Jesus whispered in your ear this morning. Put it there. And I'll be praying with you and our prayer team will be praying with you as we take these next steps in our journey with Christ. One of the phrases in that song that caught my attention was that Jesus doesn't give up on us. How thankful I am for his continuing mercy, his patient love, the fact that no matter who we are or what we've done, he continues to work by his spirit to draw us to himself in his forgiving mercy, which we all need. Yes, Lord, even me. Remember this coming week that Jesus loves you. Remember that Jesus likes you. Remember that Jesus wants you and that Jesus wants to hang out with you. So let him do it. And let's live life this coming week in the very presence of God. Thank you for worshiping together, and we'll see you next Sunday.